Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to lecture number 14. Let me share the screen. Here it is. So as a brief reminder, during the last lecture, we discussed the theory of gravitational waves. Let me start the annotations yeah, over here and over here. So when we were discussing gravitational waves, uh, its theory, the two possible polarizations, the geometry of a plane wave, and the last topic we discussed was the energy flux formula for a plane wave. Uh, today we will first continue this topic. So we'll talk about generating gravitational waves. So we consider the following physical situation. Uh, we've got a vacuum space-time with a small region somewhere in, in around x equal to zero in which there is no vacuum, there is some kind of source. And we assume the source to be time dependent. So we imagine a kind of world tube, four dimensional world tube, where the stress energy tensor does not vanish. And this tensor is supposed to represent, represent the uh, some kind of motion of matter within this region, but not outside. We assume that the size of this region is given by this epsilon over here. Uh, and that, uh, and what we want to calculate is the gravitational waves emitted by this configuration in this vacuum spacetime at some large distance x, uh, at the point t x i. Uh, this uh, line over here is a null geodesic uh, in the background flat spacetime connecting point t x uh, with, let's say, the center of mass of this. Uh, region uh, or of this body or, or this region which is emitting the gravitational wave. So the assumptions are that we have complete vacuum outside the source's world tube, this tube over here. We assume that the size of the source is much smaller than, than the wavelength produced by the source. Mm, so epsilon is much smaller than 2 pi over omega or omega is the frequency. Uh, we assume also that the motions within the source are slow. Slow with respect to the speed of light and slow with, in fact, slow with respect to the uh, crossing time of a wave uh, through, the, uh, through this emitting region uh, of the size of epsilon. So, uh, if we compare the stress energy tensor of the of the matter in time t and time delta t, which is comparable to the crossing time of a wave from one end spot to the other, there isn't much change really going on. Although on the longer time scales, we do assume some changes. Uh, we measure the gravitational waves at a point which is very far from the source in the sense of very far uh, in comparison to the wavelengths of the wave. So we are in the radiative regime. And we assume that the gravitational binding energy of the system is negligible in comparison to the bare energy of matter contained there. These are the assumptions under which we will der derive an important formula uh, for the gravitational waves. This formula is interesting. It shows a lot of physics. But let me warn you from the very beginning that this is not a very good approximation for the type of sources uh, that are currently considered the most important sources of gravitational waves, namely coalescing binaries. So systems of two black holes, two neutron stars or black hole and neutron star uh, emitting waves exactly in the, or more or less in the moment when they merge into one object. Uh, it turns out that in this case, in fact, the slow motions uh, assumption is violated. Um, and also this gravitational binding part is not quite true. So you can't really use this formula for this case. Still, this formula is important. It's a kind of first approximation and will tell us a lot about how gravitational waves uh, form. Okay. Uh, what I want to derive is known as the quadrupole formula. So we calculate the the perturbation of the metric tensor due to the gravitational wave in the traceless transverse gauge at point Tx. And that's supposed to be 2G over 
uh, modules of X, which is basically the distance from the bar center of the system. And here we have the second derivative of a tensor IKL at the moment corresponding to the emission of wave. So we need to look at the retarded time here, uh, time which takes into account the lag due to the wave propagation to this point. And then this is projected to the space of transverse traceless tensors by this P. So this tensor I is called the reduced quadrupole moment or simply the quadrupole moment and represents the quadrupole moment of the zero zero component of the stress energy tensor or the mass density. So it's the quadrupole, uh, it's the quadrupole uh, tensor, but without the trace part. P projects to the transverse direction. And this thing here projects to the transverse traceless tensors. And as the first thing to do today, we will derive this fundamental formula. Have you got any questions to this, uh, to the assumptions or to the formula itself? Uh, okay, I don't hear any. So let's go to the blackboard. I need to share another screen, this one. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is, so let's write it this way, generating gravitational waves. That's the topic. The assumptions was that we had some kind of region over here of non-vanishing stress energy tensor. This line over here represents the bar center. The size of this region is basically epsilon. And we are looking at the point Tx where we measure the gravitational field. This over here is an null geodesic. Uh, we assume that this bar center corresponds to x equal to zero, we choose the coordinate system appropriately just to make things simpler. And we look at, let's say, h bar first. So in order to derive h, we'll have to use the Green's function formalism. We know that h satisfies the wave equation. h bar mu nu, the trace reversed h is the box of the trace reverse H is 16 pi G, the stress energy tensor. Uh, we know that in the gauge we have chosen, the transverse traceless gauge, we have this formula over here. So in the, the, the Lorentz gauge, in the Lorentz gauge, which we have chosen, uh, we know that the divergence of H bar vanishes. On top of that, we know that the divergence of the stress energy has to vanish. Conservation of, of the energy momentum. Okay, so that's what we know. Uh, so we will use the Green's function formalism to derive the formula for H. Uh, I assume that you know the Green's function. Uh, basically, we can express H mu nu at Tx as an integral uh, I will use curly G for, for the Green's function because we are, we are already using capital G for a different purpose. So you have to integrate the Green's function at T X uh, So the Green's function has two slots, T X and T prime X prime. And we integrate over the second one uh, multiplied by the sources of the wave equation, which is this right-hand side here, T mu of T prime x prime dt d3x prime prime. Uh, where this g is the retarded Green's function, which is given by the following formula.
uh, one mi minus one over four, four pi times one over x minus x prime. So basically the distance between the points x and x prime inverse times delta function or delta distribution of t prime minus t minus x minus x prime. Yeah. Uh, this is sometimes known as the retarded time, tr of t x x prime, and it corresponds. Uh, and for a given point of observation, t x, it simply corresponds to the time of emission, uh, taking into account the lag it takes for a wave to propagate from point x prime t prime to the point t x. Uh, this is the same Green's function we use in electromagnetic theory or in the theory of, of a scalar uh, wave equation. Uh, I assume you remember it from, from your electromagnetic course, but if you don't, the thing is that uh, there is infinitely many Green's function, but one of them, this particular one, is called the retarded Green's function. Uh, it has a very specific, uh, one specific feature, namely, it is equal to zero except for the fast light cone. So for a given fixed Tx, it is non-zero only on the surface of a light cone uh, going into the past of the point Tx. And this makes sense. It simply tells you that the value of the field or h bar at Tx is given entirely in terms of the uh, sources, state of sources in the past of, the, of this event over here, or more precisely, uh, over the intersection of the light cone, past light cone of this point with the wor world tube of the sources. This is the only place where this integral is non-zero and this is ensured by this delta distribution. Okay, this is known as the retarded Green's function. So we will manipulate this expression over here right now. Mm. So let's begin over here. H mu nu at Tx. Uh, so the first thing you can do is to basically uh, simplify this prefactor with that one and we get uh, one over four or pre more precisely g over four. This with that. Then we get the integral over d t prime dx prime. Uh, we have this delta prime minus tr where tr is this function over here divided by the distance between both points. Mm, and this is integrated against t mu nu of t prime x prime. Now it turns out that under the assumptions we have made on, on just a minute ago, this formula can be simplified very much and we'll do it right now. So the first thing is that um, let's go back. Oh, no, I need to switch between these two things. So if you remember, this region was supposed to be small with respect to the whole wavelength, or with respect to the distance between x equal to zero or the or x prime, and the position of the measurement. In that case. Uh, we can approximate this one over x prime minus x simply by the distance from the barycenter. The thing is that the, the, the region of emission is so small that it doesn't really matter. 
It's just one over R plus a small number epsilon. So, uh, C G over four integral instead of instead of this thing here, I'm using one over uh, distance from this point to here, which I call R. Mm, then we have the stress energy tensor of T prime X prime delta of T prime minus T retarded DT prime T three X prime. In the next step, we perform the integration with respect to T prime. It's simple because we've got a delta distribution here. So this is just G over four R. R is independent of X prime. So we can treat it as a constant. And we are left with the integral of T mu mu, T R of T X X prime, uh, x prime d3 x prime. Okay, but again, we can apply the same argument to tr over here. So we have, we are now integrating T mu nu over the intersection of a light cone with this world tube. But we have assumed that this stress energy tensor does not change very much at all uh, in the time direction. It just changed a little bit, but relatively slowly. So maybe we can simply replace the time in which we are making this uh, integration with simply the time at the intersection between T and the bar center. So in that case, this is equal to G over, so these are both are approximations. G over four integral of T mu nu of uh, T R of T X, zero prime, let's say, the position of the bar center of X prime E three X prime. Uh, and this thing here is simply the moment in which, so let's go back here. This is the retarded time corresponding to the word line of the bar center of x equal x prime equal to zero, uh, given t and x, and that's just t minus r, where r is simply the distance between the bar center and the position in which we are performing the measurement. So we can approximate this as t minus r. Okay, so here here's the formula. T mu nu, T minus R, X prime, D three X prime. Okay, that's already a fairly simple formula, but can be simplified a little bit. Uh, before we go on, do you have any questions to the derivation so far? Okay, I don't see any. So we have arrived at this thing here. Now, this is expressed in terms of all possible components of T mu nu, but that's not very convenient. Uh, the most important, arguably the most important part of T mu nu is 
two zero zero of T X or T prime X prime because it's the mass density. The quantity which has the most straightforward Newtonian analog, the mass density, and the one that is really dominating here. We know that in standard situations, pressures and uh, stress and other mass flux, uh, energy flux are subdominant to this thing. So we would like to express everything in terms of T0,0, and turns out that this is entirely possible. So we will express the result in terms of TOO only. This is a bit of a tricky calculation and we have to go through. And before we go on, we need to show a few things. So first of all, it turns out that only h bar ij, the spatial components of this tensor matter. Why is it so? The reason is the Lorentz gauge condition. Because because of the Lorentz gauge condition, we have uh, d0 h bar zero mu plus d i h by i i mu equal to zero, right? That's just the, the Lorentz rate condition, which simply means that d zero h o i is equal to minus d, let's say, j h by j a i. So we can integrate this equation over time given h i j. We can express h o i if we know h j i or h i j. It doesn't matter, h is uh, symmetrical. If we know the spatial components, we can calculate the o j one, the time and spatial. And we can do the same for the zero zero component because we have h by j zero. So when integrating this result over time, we get at h by zero zero. So these guys can be derived from h i j. The spatial part, if we know the spatial part, we can derive everything else by solving a simple ODE integrated over time. So we will only look for, for an equation for h bar i j. And the second important thing here is an identity we will use. And this identity takes a bit time to derive, but here's what it looks like. Uh, we take the second time derivative of the following expression, t0,0 of let's say x mu, which is zero and everything else, times x, uh, let's use prime here because we are used to prime. And this is here, x prime k x prime l. Now it turns out that this thing here is equal to 2 t k prime l prime at the same point, of course, plus a big expression which has the form of a divergence of a vector. And this vector over here is a combination, uh, just one thing. I mean here, I mean here spatial divergence, sorry for that. So it can be written as dk over k or this thing here is a combination of TKL, DL, T 
TKM B A D B T K L. So it's a combination of T, its first derivatives and second derivatives. Uh, why is this identity important? Well, because we'll need to integrate this KL thing uh, according to this formula in order to get, get H bar KL. Uh, and this simply tells us that we can instead integrate this expression over here. And we've got this term here. But this time is a, is a full divergence. The integral over a volume of a full divergence is from the Stokes theorem, just a surface integral of this, uh, or more precisely the flux of this X over a closed surface. But uh, here's the important bit. We call that T vanishes everywhere outside this region. So when we perform our integral over the whole space time, or over the whole space, we can, for example, terminate it at some large radius. And since all components of T vanish there, this surface integral does not really contribute. So according to, thanks to this identity over here, we'll be able to convert this integral into the integral of this thing over here which is expressed only in terms of T0, 0. Mm. Is this clear? Do you have questions? Okay, I assume you don't. So we will proceed uh, by proving this identity over here. So the derivation of the quadrupole formula is not very simple, it's in fact a bit tricky, but the result is I think very interesting. So now proof of the identity. Uh, so we've got the conservation of the stress energy tensor, which we can write simply this way. J, JK, we've got these two formulas and we'll apply them to the second derivative forgive me I will not be writing primes here it's just it's just to save the, the, the space uh, so team you knew depends on X alpha. Okay. So D zero, zero is just the time coordinate. So we can, uh, the derivatives of the spatial ones with respect to zero are zero by definition. So we just get D zero squared, D zero, zero, X K, X L, which is equal to D zero. And here we have D0, T0, 0, but we will use this identity over here. X, K, X, L. Mm. We can change the order of taking the partial derivatives here because these are partial derivatives in a flat background space time. So we can write as minus dk. Or maybe let's go to the next line. d0, t, 0k. I'm changing the order of indices in a symmetric tensor xk, xl. Okay, I want to bring back these two uh, guys, these, these products under the differentiation, but this time, uh, oops, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. I need to use a different letter here for the summation because there's, I'm already using K and L as, as an external index. Sorry for that. So let me call it A. 
I'm the same here. Mm, yeah. Now I want to bring back this these two guys under the differentiation, but I cannot do it without any um, additional terms because, well, we're differentiating this time with respect to the spatial components of, uh, and differentiating this guy with respect to spatial components, it's made of spatial XK and XL, will produce new terms. So let's write it this way. DA uh, XK XL T zero T A zero. And now this will produce also, this differentiation would also pr produce terms like delta Ka from differentiating here, attacking here, or delta, delta Al from attacking here. So let's write it this way. It's gonna be delta Ka x L D zero T A zero plus differentiating this guy, that would be delta L A x K times T zero T A zero. Mm -hmm. uh, so this guy over here is a full divergence. So let's write it as minus dA something A. That's a part of our X. And it's made of D O T A R T A O as we wished. So this guy is a full divergence. Uh, here we can Uh, we can contract the Kronecker deltas with, with K and L, and we get T plus T K zero X. Mm, sorry, forgot the differentiation. Plus D zero. T K zero X L plus D zero T L zero X K. Okay. So now we can use this identity over here to apply to these two terms. So we get from this one uh, minus D J T K J X L plus the same thing with K and L reversed. This is just the same term, but with the, these two guys, with the role of these two guys reversed. Mm, minus the divergence part. And now we play again by bringing XL under the differentiation again. So that will be minus DJ, TKJ, XL. But this will produce an additional term minus TKJ delta JL. So we have to Again, get rid of that. So this is T K J delta L J plus the same thing with K and L reversed. And now this guy here is again a full divergence. So we can bring it to the full divergence term. 
divergence proportional to k. So we are left with plus t k l. This guy produces the same thing, but with k and l reversed. So two l k and another term we can uh, merge with the differentiation with the total divergence term. Then we realize that these are two t is symmetric, so we just get two t k l plus a big divergence term t a x a. Yes. And this X is made of uh, TKJ terms and also the time derivative of A0 terms. So yeah, everything works as it should. Have you got any questions to this proof? Okay, you don't. In fact, it's just applying consistently these type of uh, these two identities, and then applying the uh, the chain rule for uh, or the rule for product for differentiation in order to bring in or out this type of xk xl or xk terms, producing full divergences and also this thing here. Okay, so we can apply our identity. Uh, we know that now that TKL is equal to one half T zero zero XKXL minus one half DAXA. So H bar mu, let's go back to the previous. That's G over 4R integral of this over the spatial components, over the spatial variables. A serious mistake on the very beginning. Oh, not a serious one. Uh, it's not G over four, it's four G. Sorry for that. So let me make the derivation a bit more clear. It's supposed to be four G instead of G over four. Right? Because we have 16 pi G over four pi, so that's four G. And we have to consistently correct this over here and over here. Yeah, so it's just a prefactor which was wrong before in front of the integral. Yeah, so we have 4G over R, uh, integral, oh, and recall that we are just interested in the KL components, the spatial ones, because we have found the time-like ones not that interesting. So that's the integral of the T KL components of T minus R, R, X prime, T three, X prime. But according to the formula above, this is two G over R integral over T. So raising the indices doesn't cost anything. It's the same as T upper KL, so we can write it as T zero or zero X, again, T minus R X prime, X prime K, X prime L, T three X prime. Plus, well, we've got this integral over here. 
which is a board which is a boundary integral of x a n a d to sigma where d to sigma is the integral over the boundary but we know that when we make the region we integrate over sufficiently big this guy is going to vanish so this guy is equal to zero for sufficiently large region of integration. Basically, the region of the integration must be larger than this region. And we are supposed to integrate over the whole constant time slice up all the way to infinity. But already when we take a sphere which, which has a radius larger than epsilon, this is going to vanish. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are fairly close. H bar chi L at T X. This is approximately two G over R. Uh, now, oh, sorry, and there was supposed to be D zero squared, the derivative with respect to uh, the T prime, uh, the, the, the time at, T, at, at the emission point. Uh, but the dependence, but look at look at it this way. Uh, okay, so let's write it again. This is d over d x zero prime t zero zero evaluated at t prime equals to t minus r and x prime x prime k, x prime l, d 3 x. But this is the same thing as d over dt squared of t0, 0, 0 at t minus r, x prime. So it's the same thing as it would differentiate with respect to t, uh, the time of the observation, because these two are just related by a constant offset r. Okay, but if this is the case, we can take the differentiation in front of the integration. We don't bother with mathematics very much. We assume that we can do it. Uh, here we got t0, 0 of t minus r x prime times times x k prime x l prime d three x prime. Okay, so now let's define define the let's say unreduced quadruple moment of the source. Capital A K L of T. That's going to be just the integral of T zero zero. T X prime X K prime X L prime D three X prime. Mm, then so we just take the mass density distribution and integrate over this product here, uh, taking the bar center of the system as, as our base point. And this way we get the quadruple moment. Uh, quantity quite similar to the moment of inertia of the system. Uh, but different by, by coefficient and, and by the presence of some other terms over here, but something similar to the moment of inertia. Okay, so now H A L bar at T 
dx. That's approximately 2g over r. And then we have the second derivative of this i k l of t. So at every moment, our configuration has some kind of um, quadruple moment. This quadruple moment changes with time because this we assume that the source is in motion. And the second derivative of this quantity gives uh, evaluated at the moment at the retarded time gives us the uh, wave H mu. Okay, this is almost all. We are almost there. We could stop here, but there's still one thing I would like to do. So, so far we were just in the Lorentz gauge, but I would like to go to the transverse traceless gauge. Uh, because it's a bit simpler and, and it's a bit easier to see what is going on in the transverse traceless gauge. We know that we can impose it in plane waves, but what is created by a single source is not quite a plane wave. Mm, it's, it's some kind of spherical wave. However, when we are very far away from the source, uh, the, the curvature of the wave fronts is very small, and the wave looks more or less like a plane wave because of the large distance from the source. And if it is the case, we can at least locally apply the argument from the previous lecture that there is a gauge transformation which brings us back, which brings us to the uh, transverse trace gauge without violating the Lorentz gauge. So I locally apply that. And if you recall, uh, this basically amounts to projecting out everything except the transverse traceless part. So locally applying the transformation to the TTH. So we get HKL TT of T X R. Uh, recall that if, if this is a transverse traceless gauge, there is no trace, so there is no reason to distinguish the trace reverse from the full metric perturbation. So that's just the KL part of the full metric transformation. And note that in this gauge, there is no H0K or H00, so we can forget about them. There is not, even no point of solving the equations we have derived. Uh, I think over here, because everything vanishes when we impose this gauge. So this is equal to uh, two G over R integral over X prime. Uh, e over dt squared uh, t zero zero times x a prime x l prime, and now we have to multiply this by sorry, we have to perform the projection, so let me call it a prime, b prime, and now we perform the projection. So we take k a prime, b l b prime minus one half b k l b a prime b prime, where This P over here, that's just the projection tensor P I K equal to delta I K minus X I X K over X squared. That's the projection to the transverse direction over here. So in order to pass to the 
to this gauge, we have to apply certain Xi, but the effect was pretty much the same as if we have multiplied this thing here with this projection tensor here, which projects out everything except the transverse modes and also removes the trace. Uh, and this is almost the final result. In the final step, I will just write it as HKLTT x prime equals to 2G over R. Again, I write down this whole, whole integral simply as the second derivative of the ij tensor then this is multiplied by this whole projector e i k d j l minus one half e k j e so p k l e i j Okay, in the last step, we can write down this symmetric tensor as a traceless part, which I write with scripted i plus the trace, a one third i a k delta i j, where i i j is equal to i k l without the trace, but that's just the integral of t zero zero t x x i x j, and we have to remove the trace, which is basically one third x k x a delta i j. So what, what we have done here is just to write down IJL as this thing here without a trace plus the trace explicitly. But then when you plug in this formula, you will quick, quickly discover that this delta IJ term is actually killed by the projection over here. So H chi L T T. So it doesn't really contribute. So we can simply write down that this is 2G over R, the second derivative of the scripted guy, reduced quadruple moment. So the quadruple moment without the trace part over dt squared, e i k e j l minus one half e k l e i j, the projection operator. Yeah, and I think this is the formula I wanted to derive. Have you got questions to this derivation? It was fairly heavy, to be honest. Probably the most heavy derivation we have done in this lecture. But the formula in the end isn't that difficult. It simply expresses the transverse traces gauge perturbation in terms of the second derivatives of the reduced quadrupole formula, uh, quad, uh, quadrupole moment uh, evaluated at uh, T prime equals to T minus R. Okay, I don't hear any questions. So in that case, let's make a 10 minute break. Let me share the screen. We should back at 10, eight. So thank you very much and see you in 10 minutes. Okay, so hello everyone. It's already eight minutes past 10. So it's time for the second part of our lecture. So on the blackboard, we have derived the gravitational waves formula. It's a formula which tells us what is the value of the perturbation due to the gravitational waves created by a source, which is, uh, uh, which is isolated. It's, it's a finite and relatively small region of space where the stressed energy transfer doesn't vanish. There is some motion going on there. Uh, and we measure this field at a distance which is very far away from the source in, com in comparison with the 
the typical wavelength. And the uh, transverse traceless uh, perturbation, the, the only relevant spatial part of that, turns out to be basically proportional to the second order derivative of the reduced quadrupole moment of the source at the retarded time corresponding to the position and time of the measurement. Uh, on top of that, the, the this perturbation or the strain is inversely proportional to the distance from the source. So the further we are, the weaker gravitational wave we see. That's something we could have predicted, in fact. Mm. Uh, there is a 2G prefactor, and there is a, a projection tensor to the transverse traceless tensors. Let's go to the next slide. We can easily turn this formula into a formula for the total emitted energy by, by the system. So recall that last time we have derived the formula for the flux of a gravitational of a plane gravitational wave. Far away from the source, the source, the, the wave looks pretty much like a mixture of two polarizations of gravitational waves. Uh, so what we can do is to take these the fluxes of these two polarizations, sum them and integrate the result over a big sphere uh, around the source, at a large distance around the source with appropriate area element. And this will give us the total power uh, emitted by the system at the appropriate retarded time. Uh, it turns out that, so, so the derivation is a little bit difficult, uh, quite algebraic, Okay, it's, it's not difficult conceptually. Conceptual is quite easy, but the algebra is a little bit messy. If you want to, you can have a look at Sean Carroll's textbook. The details are, derived, are, are shown there. Possibly also in Misner, Thorne and Wheeler, but I'm not sure. Uh, the bottom line is that in the end, the formula turns out to be relatively simple. You just take uh, g over five minus g over five and the average of the I and the average of, of the third derivatives, the square of the third derivatives of the reduced quadrupole moment. Uh, and this thing here basically denotes uh, coarse graining or uh, integration over a couple of periods of of of, uh, of a typical wavelength of typical gravitational wave. This thing tends to be quite variable. And we have to average over a couple of uh, periods of the wave in order to get the power. What is important here is that this is obviously a negative number, so radiating systems lose energy. There is no other way. Again, not, not surprisingly. So we have shown that gravitational waves are physical in the most basic sense of this word. Of this word. They take away some energy from the system. And later, if we have a, a, a physical oscillator, they can deposit a bit of this energy somewhere else. They transport energy just like any other way. Okay, now we can think a little bit about the sources of gravitational waves. Uh, how can we produce them? Uh, the simplest possible case is to consider two very heavy masses revolving around the bar its barycenter. So we've got mass M1, M2, uh, and they revolve around the barycenter. I don't assume the masses to be equal, so uh, the distances R1 and R2 from the bar center can be different, but the total distance between them is assumed to be A. So this is the formula for R1 and R2. Uh, I assume that the motion is happening in the XY plane with some angular frequency or angular velocity omega. And in that case, we can write down the formula for the full um, quadrupole moment of the system. It's relatively easy because you integrate basically point masses, which correspond to delta-like uh, distribution of matter at uh, in the stress energy tensor. Uh, the reduced one, well, you just need to subtract the trace. Uh, so it's equal to mu a squared, where mu is, is uh, is this type of expression. It appears quite often in the uh, in the theory of 
a binary system. I think it's called reduced mass, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, it's given by this formula over here. So it's a kind of measure of mass of the system or its inertia taking into account, taking into account both of these masses. Mm, okay. Uh, we would like to apply the uh, quadruple formula we have derived just uh, a moment ago. In order to do it, it's best to apply tri trigonometric identities, which what we have here in, in the components of this matrix here is the is the products and squares of trigonometric functions, and they can be expressed in terms of trigonometric functions of two omega t. That's relatively simple. Uh, if you apply that, you get the following uh, formula for the reduced quadruple moment, mu a squared over two, and here you have appropriate functions of uh, two omega t everywhere. Uh, and then we can apply the quadrupole formula. Uh, I'm not so much interested in this thing over here. Uh, oh, by the way, there's, I think there's a mistake. There should not be one, three, one third uh, and two third over here. Sorry for that. I'm less interested in this transverse traceless time dependent part. I'll be from now on more interested in the prefactor, which tells us about the magnitude of the of the effect or the strain produced by the system. It will give us how an understanding how big the effect of gravitational wave really is. And spoiler alert, it's actually very small. Before going on, we reintroduce the speed of light into the into the formula. Uh, this is relatively easy. Uh, we just have to remember that. We are differentiating twice with respect to time. And here uh, we have been working in, in uh, a, a coordinate system in which time was measured in meters. So we have to change d over dt into d over dct, which will produce a c squared in the denominator. And on top of that, uh, if, we, if we decide to measure the time in meters, we, we also had to modify the gravitational constant, bringing it back gives another c squared in the denominator. And the net effect is that we get c to the power of four here. So we've got the physical quantities, mu, the reduced mass, a, the size of the system, omega, the, uh, uh, the frequency, r, the distance from, from the system, and the prefactor is g over c to the power of four. And this is obviously a very small number. If you remember the gravitational constant is of the order of the 10 to minus 11 in the SI units. Uh, the speed of light is 10 to 8, and this is in the power of, of 4. So in the denominator, we've got uh, 10 to minus 32. So the whole prefactor is very, very small, and we expect very small HIG. So let's try to think about uh, uh, building a laboratory source of gravitational waves. So I assume we have two masses of, of the order of around one ton. That's reasonable. That's something you can manipulate in your lab. It's not very easy to manipulate, but in principle you could. Take a typical size of, of this thing, let, let it be one meter. Uh, I take the angular frequency to be one radian per second, so one revolution per second. So two one ton masses revolving with this frequency, that would require a big support, but that's feasible. However, the problem is that the strain of the gravitational wave we get will be around 10 to minus 41 times one meter divided by the distance from the system. And in order to be shielded from the direct effects of, this, of these masses or tidal fields, you would prefer to be somewhat further away from the system to measure that. So the strain is 10 to minus 40 something. And this is a ridiculously small number. Uh, it's so small that I don't think there's any hope we'll ever produce a lab source here. There's just too big of a gap uh, between what, what you can produce and what the astrophysical surfaces we, we can produce. Uh, I don't, I can't imagine increasing any of these quantities by many orders of magnitude, which would be required to get any any kind of reasonable gravitational wave. So no lab sources ever. So we have to rely on astrophysical sources. 
Now, astrophysical sources, most typical astrophysical sources have the same type, has exa have exactly this, this type of, um, are exactly sources of this type. You've got two astrophysical masses, stars, neutron stars, black holes, orbiting each other on a relatively tight orbit with relatively high frequency in astronomical terms. I will assume that we're dealing with a circular capillarian orbit. So there is no physical bar which connects these things, it's just their gravity. And in that case, there is a simple formula for the uh, frequency omega related to the formula for period in terms of the total mass of the system and this A, which is in this case known as the uh, semi-major axis. So in a circular Kaplan orbit, we can eliminate omega in favor of A. And that produces a fairly simple expression, but it's not the most common one. In fact, people more often eliminate A in favor of omega, which produces a somewhat more complicated expression with stranger powers appearing. Now I will assume that the masses of both of these constituents are comparable equal to some kind of big M. And in that case, the reduced mass is, I think, M over two. So it's also comparable to M. And the simplest estimate for HIJ is then GM to the power of five over three, omega to the power of two over three, divided by C to the fourth times uh, the R, which is the distance from the source. So let's plug in some physical numbers. So assume you, we have a binary system of white dwarfs. So certain types of stars which have already evolved and are, are now cooling down. I assume that their masses are proportion um, comparable to two solar masses. That's that's reasonable. They're on a fairly tight orbit. So the 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 one period is about one hour. That's also there are systems of this kind. Uh, now in the galaxy I as a distance I take some kind of typical galactic distance one kiloparsec. Uh, just for reference, if you don't know, kiloparsec is a typical measurement of distance within our galaxy. Our distance to the galaxy center is about 8.5 kiloparsecs. The size of the galaxies around, I don't remember, 20, 30 kiloparsecs. You'd have to check that. So this is nearby. This is within our galaxy and not very far from the solar system. And in that case, Hij is multiplied by 10 to minus 21. So there's still a small prefactor, but another, not a ridiculously small prefactor. That's a big difference between minus 40 something and minus 20 something. This is, as you, this is more or less measurable. Uh, for binary neutron stars, the masses may be larger or maybe somewhat smaller. Uh, however, during the late time of, of evolution of this type of system, um, these two neutron stars can be pretty close to each other, and the period may be very, very small, 10 to minus 2 seconds, for example, shortly before the coalescence. Uh, these sources can be measured from much further away, 100 megaparsecs of extra galactic distance. The prefactor is again 10 to minus 22, more or less, so still within some kind of reasonable uh, range. The bottom line is that astrophysical sources are much more efficient, even, even though they are much further away than anything you can produce in the lab. Distance is not that much of a problem. Uh, the fact that we can't manipulate solar masses is a much bigger problem. Okay, so what about the total power of the source? We applied the formula. Again, we bring back the, the speed of light in order to make things a little bit more uh, clear conceptually, and we work in the SI system. In this case, we get G over five C to the power of five, which is even more disastrous than before, right? Uh, C to the power of five is already uh, 10 to minus 14 DSI units. Uh, this is what we get when you plug in the, the formula for um, two masses revolving on circular orbits, the bar center. So the problem we're dealing with, that's the total luminosity, which is minus the power. Uh, for a circular Keplerian orbit, we can massage this formula a little bit more. 
Uh, again, I assume that the masses are comparable. And in that case, what we get can be expressed very neatly. I think the, the nicest expression you can get is this one over here. Uh, so what you get is c to the power of five over g, and then you've got the uh, a dimensionless quantity characterizing the system. g m omega over c to the power of third, that's a dimensionless number. It's taken to the power of 10 to minus three. And this multiplies an expression c to the power of five divided by g. Now, interesting thing is that this has the dimension of watts. So this is a kind of natural unit of power of, of luminosity of a source in GR. Uh, it turns out that GR has a natural unit of luminosity built in, uh, which you get by combining the fifth power of the speed of light with G. Uh, it's equal to 10 to 5, 52 watts. So it's a pretty large number, in fact, but this is multiplied by a really small number for, for most sources, taking, in fact, a small number in power more than three. So let's plug in some numbers. The first thing that would probably come to your mind would be the Earth-Sun system, where you have relatively uh, big sun of, of the mass of equal to one solar mass, relatively light Earth, distance of 150 uh, millions of kilometers, uh, and omega equal to one over a year. The total radiative gravitational power of gravitational waves is very interestingly a very earthly type of thing, namely 200 watts. And that sounds like a reasonable power of, I don't know, electrical devices you use at your home. But from astronomical perspective, this is a very small number. So gravitational radiation has negligible influence on the dynamics of the system. Uh, and in fact, not much changes when you take the Jupiter, the, the, the most massive system, you get only something about five kilowatts. So for the solar system, the emission of gravitational waves is very small, in fact, completely negligible in, in the total balance of, uh, of energy. So let's have a look at the Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar. We talked about this system. It's, it's a system discovered in the 60s or maybe 70s, consisting of uh, a pulsar, so a, a, a compact neutron star, which is emitting flashes of light in a very regular way, and a companion star, which is uh, also a neutron star. They form a fa fairly tight system. They're just 1.9 times to 6 kilometers apart. That's relatively close for this system. The period is about seven, about seven to eight hours. Thanks to the properties of this pulsar, it was fairly it was possible to determine all the orbital elements of the system. If we plug in the formula we have derived here, we get the power of 10 to 23 watts, which is not that small. But this is not a correct thing to do because this system turns out to be to, to have also fairly high eccentricity of 0 0.71. So these things are not revolving as as, as not revolving uniformly. Uh, the system speeds up when, when these two guys get closer together and slows down uh, periodically. It turns out that it increases the output of, of gravitational wave quite considerably, and the total luminosity can be calculated it's about 10 to 24, so an order of magnitude larger. Interestingly, this is not such a small number in comparison to the total binding energy of this system. This is still a small fraction, but not a but not a completely negligible fraction. So these this system loses energy in a measurable way because of the gravitational wave's emission. And the loss of energy, um, a kind of radiative drug in this type of system leads to uh, basically these two stars getting closer, closer together and the period decreases. And the velocities of these two guys increase. This may look paradoxical at first. Uh, the system is losing energy. So based on your everyday experience with solid bodies, you would expect the motion to slow down. But in fact, in Keplerian system, something opposite happens. When something loses energy, uh, it gets closer and closer to the to the bar center and it speeds up. But, the, but nevertheless, uh, the loss of the potential gravitational potential energy is much bigger. So the system is losing energy. The change of period is something measurable. And in fact, uh, the, this change of, of the period 
of the order of 10 to minus 15 seconds per year was observed in this system. And it's very, it was very much consistent with the uh, formula for the gravitational waves production. It was a very important discovery and both astronomers obtained many years later a Nobel Prize for that. It was an important direct, indirect indication that gravitational waves are a thing. Yeah, have you got any more questions to that? Okay, probably not. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about, the, the last topic connected to gravitational waves is the detectors of gravitational waves. As you probably know, we can detect gravitational waves directly on Earth nowadays. We've got appropriate detectors. Uh, the most common, the most important one, and in fact, the only one that can do it on Earth is, is, is so-called interferometric detectors, detectors which use the interference of light to register the passage of a gravitational wave. So on the right-hand side, uh, you've got my attempt at drawing a, a rough geometric picture of what a detector of this, of this kind looks like. Basically, it's an interferometer. It consists of a laser emitting highly stable um, beam of, of electromagnetic radiation uh, of a very stable frequency, which is then sent to a beam splitter, which splits this thing into uh, two identical beams, one of them traveling along one arm of the interferometer, the other one traveling along the other arm. In this arm, you've got cavities formed by mirrors and another mirrors, which is partially transparent. So there is quite a bit of energy consist deposited between these two, the two mirrors in both arms. And now part of the slide returns to the beam splitter and the everything is in, arranged in such a way that, so, so the beam splitter acts coherently. The, 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 the waves uh, both reflected and, and the wave passing through have consistent phases when they move here. And the system is arranged in such a way that in the absence of any displacements or either gravitational waves, the phase of the returning waves is such that all the wave passes through back to the laser and no wave is reflected towards the detector. So there's a complete destructive interference in the direction of the det detector over here, if there is no signal. However, when a gravitational wave passes, something interesting happens. We haven't calculated that ourselves directly, but it turns out that when there is a gravitational wave, then the time of arrival of electromagnetic signals between two uh, free-falling bodies is affected a little bit. It's either a bit shorter or longer, depending on the phase of the wave, on the uh, angle between the direction of wave propagation and the, uh, the tensor giving the polarization and the direction along which the light is propagating. But there is an effect. It might happen that the light comes a bit earlier than we expect or a bit later. In case of, these, uh, of this interferometer, this means that the phase of the wave is slightly different than what we expected because there is a difference between arm one and arm two due to the gravitational wave propagation. This situation perturbs this, this situation, it, it produces a perturbation and the, the perfect destructive interference here is lost. Some was, a little bit of photons will pass into the detector. And this is exactly the reading of this detector, which is the main observable here. This is what physically measures the presence of the gravitational wave. Now, the light bounces more than once along each of these arms. These arms are of, are of the length of a few hundred to a few kilometers, and the light may pass even hundreds of times between these mirrors. So the time uh, and the phase difference accumulates quite a bit uh, before the light reaches the, the beam speeder again and interferes. It turns out that detectors of this kind can detect this 10 to minus 20 something 21, 22 type of signal relatively easily. There is four of such detectors operating throughout the world. 
uh, or more precisely five because LIGO has two different detectors in two different parts of the United States. The sources, they're, they're tuned to our coalescing compact binaries. So systems of two neutron stars or black hole and neutron stars of two black holes. Uh, at the end of their life, when, when they're very close to each other, they have lost a lot of energy due to gravitational radiation emission. They're very close to each other. Their period is very short. They revolve with very high frequency. And because of that, they emit very, uh, very powerful gravitational waves. At the moment of their coalescence, of, of the merger, uh, there is a peak of, of, of emission power, there's an outburst of gravitational energy, and then the system settles back uh, to a single state in something called the Ridinal phase. It is exactly this a, a couple of seconds during this type of merger that the emission is powerful enough to be detectable by these detectors. Uh, they look at frequencies between 10 hertz and 10 kilohertz. Again, it's very human type of uh, unit. This is more or less the, the acoustic unit. This is the, the, the frequencies of the music you're listening to quite interestingly. So you can turn this signal into acoustic signal and listen to it without any kind of conversion. You can, you can really do it. Uh, and since the first detection in 2015, there were many others, probably close to 100. I haven't checked the exact numbers Last year, I think it was around 90, but there's probably more going on uh, as the detectors operate. Um, so there's about 100 confirmed. But don't take this number too literal, literally. Please Google it up yourself if you're curious. OK. Do you have any questions to interferometers as gravitational wave detectors? OK. I think the main take is that uh, what we detect here is basically the variations of times of arrival of, of electromagnetic signals between mirrors um, in uh, due to the passage of gravitational wave. That's, that's the most important thing. Uh, by the way, the mirrors are not fixed. They're suspended on thin, uh, thin wires or, or, or thin springs. So they, at least they're in free fall in the horizontal direction, not so much in the, in the vertical one, but in the horizontal direction, they're in free fall. Uh, yeah. OK. The second type of detector, which uh, turned out to be successful in detecting gravitational waves, are pulsar timing arrays. Here is, again, my attempt at presenting what they really are. So we have uh, our Earth with, with uh, a couple of radio astronomical observatories. Uh, the observatories then uh, identify a number of pulsars um, within our galaxy, pulsars which have relatively large frequencies, uh, but which are also fairly stable. So they emit flashes of electromagnetic radiation with pretty high stability. Uh, a few hundreds per second, and the 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 we try to identify each pulse and time each of time the and, and calculate the time of arrival of each of these pulses from each of these pulsars. Now, the, the principle of 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 action of these uh, of these detectors is in a way very similar. Again, we look at the variations of times of arrival of electromagnetic waves due to the gravitational waves passing nearby. So this thing here is supposed to uh, represent a passing gravitational wave. Uh, an important difference is that now the uh, distance from the Earth to the source, these, these pulsars, is not smaller, is not much smaller than the wavelength. In fact, it's the opposite. This distance is much larger than the wavelengths we're looking at. So the detection is a little bit different. We are not really looking for any particular wave source, what these uh, experiments aim for is to detect this gravitational wave stochastic background. Stochastic background is basically the noise of all possible sources operating at a given frequency combined together. It's the counterpart of the situation you are in when you go to a party and everybody's talking in a very loud voice. You, you, you lose the ability to track each individual voice, you just hear the noise of all these people talking together. 
And something similar happens here. There's a lot of astrophysical sources in the frequency this thing is operating in. It's unlikely we'll be able to identify any single one of them, but the total power in a given frequency should be something we can detect. Basically, this stochastic background adds, uh, ask, acts as an additional source of noise in the times of arrival. So we have a certain model of the pulsar, its kinematics. From that, we, we should be able to predict when exactly each of the pulses is going to come. But when we measure this times of arrival very precisely using atomic clocks, we will see some systematic delays or noise. We also have to take, take into account, of course, the kinematics of the Earth revolving around the uh, bar center of the solar system. But if we subtract that, there will still be some kind of noise. There is many sources of this noise. And there's the instrumental noise. There's the noise due to the um, passage in, in, in some kind of plasma uh, in the solar system. Uh, there is also the effects of each individual pulsar Pulsars are not perfectly um, regular sources, but more or less. However, there is a clever way to distinguish this type of noise from the noise due to gravitational waves. Namely, if we look at the correlation of the noise between two different sources at different points on the sky, the gravitational waves induced noise should exhibit a very characteristic correlation pattern depending on the angular separation of these two sources. So what these experiments do is to take a large number of pulsars, around 100, track them simultaneously uh, for many, many years, uh, register each pulse, then look at the reduced you know, time of arrival and search for noise, which exhibits a very characteristic pattern of correlation, anti-correlation, depending on, depending on where, between each two pulsars, depending on their angular separation on the sky. Basically, if the pulsars are very close on the sky, the noise should be correlated, but when they're at 90 degrees, it should be anti-correlated. And then again, when we consider a pulsar and a pulsar uh, on the opposite side, there should be smaller correlation. The evidence for signal was reported in 2023 by five, four or five, I think four groups, because some of them work together. Uh, they were looking at the frequency band of about of nanohertz, which is basically one over a year to one over 10 years. So this type of frequencies. Uh, yeah. And it's the, it seems that they have found uh, evidence for the stochastic background exactly due to this, this type of correlation patterns in the times of arrival of pulses from pulsars. Have you got any questions to the pulsar timing arrays? Okay, I don't hear any. So I would like to conclude the gravitational waves part of our lecture with a few remarks. We have derived the quadrupole formula. And the quadrupole formula, apart from many things, also tells us that there is no such thing as monopole gravitational waves. You need a time-dependent quadrupole to produce gravitational waves. And this has an important physical consequence, namely, Radial oscillations of heavy objects do not produce gravitational waves. So there is many types of stars which are usually quite heavy, which undergo radial oscillations due to various types of instabilities. They grow larger and then they shrink, grow larger and shrink. Uh, these oscillations can be violent, but they do not lead to any kind of gravitational wave production. You need more complicated motion of the mass distribution in the system. Now, unlike electromagnetic waves, gravitational waves are weak and hardly interact with matter at all. We have seen that. You, you need big masses to, to, to have any kind of interaction whatsoever. This has a nice advantage, namely, <clears throat> unlike electromagnetic waves, gravitational waves are not attenuated and do not scatter on anything in, in any appreciable degree. So whatever is produced by an astro astrophysical source reaches us basically unscattered and unattenuated. Uh, the wavelengths of the sources we con consider are usually uh, very large in comparison to the size of these sources. So um, that's simply how, how the sources of gravitational waves work. And this means that no matter what, the sources will not be cannot be resolved. We cannot see uh, individual stars producing gravitational waves 
even if you have some kind of super powerful detector, being able to pinpoint the gravitational wave with large uh, resolution. It's simply that the wavelength is too big for that. You can on, only register the fact that there is a powerful source, but the sources are too small with respect to the wavelength. On top of that, in many situations, wave effects are not negligible and you have to take them into account. And as, as you have seen, the, the frequencies we're talking about are much lower than the electromagnetic counterparts. Sources are usually quite coherent. So we are talking about revolving systems, when uh, revolving binary systems, uh, which are fairly stable. So we can integrate the signal over many periods. And that's an advantage when we want to make a detection. However, the signal is very small and registering the signal took many years of, of technological advance. Uh, an important part of this of this investment was the the fact was the the uh, production of waveforms. So basically, uh, in these interferometers, the signal to noise ratio is usually not that great. And in order to beat this problem, it's good to know what we are listening to. So we would like to perform template matching. We would like to have templates of signals coming from coalescing binaries and match them to what we see. Uh, however, how can we obtain this, this, this thing? Uh, this type of events are beyond the applicability of simple formulas like the quadruple formula. So it turned out that the only way to obtain them is to simulate this type of coalescing system on a, comp on a supercomputer. And this requires a lot of progress in the area of numerical relativity or solving the Einstein equations on a computer. It's not just the computer power, it's also how you pose the system, um, how you translate to a discretized system you can solve on a computer, which took a long time to develop. But now we can do it, we've got waveforms and we can match the signal to, uh, to these waveforms in order to extract it from, from a signal full of noise. And the last remark, which is, I think, quite important. Interferometers do not detect the flux of gravitational waves, unlike electromagnetic detectors, which typically more or less detect the energy deposited by, the, by an electromagnetic wave. Instead, interferometers measure directly the strain produced by the gravitational wave, H. And that's quite a bit of a difference, because we have seen from the quadruple formula that H scales like one over the distance from the source. But the energy flux scales like one over the distance squared, right? Well, that's quite a bit of a difference when you're looking at sources which are very far away. What does it mean? Well, imagine that you already have a detector which is able to detect many sources. If you increase the sensitivity twice, this means that for a given source type of source, you'll be able to pick up sources from twice as far away. So the volume you're, from which you'll be able to pick up signals will increase eight times. Now for electromagnetic instruments, which use flux, uh, this is not so great because the, uh, the increase will be much smaller than that. You can calculate yourself simply because the, uh, the flux scales in a less favorable way. So it's in a sense much easier to make progress once you um, with gravitational waves uh, in, in looking into further and further uh, sources. Partially because we are looking at strain and partially because there is no uh, obscuration or no attenuation or no scattering of these waves. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about gravitational waves. Uh, any questions? Okay, I don't hear any. So let's go to the next big topic, the Schwarzschild solution. So the Schwarzschild solution of, of uh, Einstein equations is the first exact solution of the Einstein equations found in 1916 by Karl Schwarzschild. It represents the gravitational field outside a spherically symmetric massive body without any kind of spin or a black hole without any kind of spin. In fact, the theory of black holes basically started from attempts of mathematicians, mathematical physicists, and physicists to understand this solution. It is exactly the, the, the type of reasonings we will present in this lecture, which basically led to the emergence of the black hole theory. Uh, 
it was also the Schwarzschild solution in which very important relativistic effects were found, so CR effects. So historically, it's a very important solution, one of the most important ones. Uh, it's derived under the assumption that the space-time and the mass distribution and the space-time are completely spherically symmetric. I think intuitively it is clear what this means. We can rotate the system and it does not change. Uh, that it is static, meaning that it's stationary, it doesn't change with time. But also, uh, it has the time reversal symmetry. If you change the time, if you change the direction of the flow of time, nothing changes. This uh, this is a, a different thing than than for 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 example a rotating solution. In a rotating solution, if you play the the if you record this, if you record a rotating star, and then play the movie backwards, you will see the difference because rotation is not time reversal symmetric. But a, a, a static one, well, you can play the movie forward or backward, you will not see any difference because there's a time reversal symmetry. So Schwarz's solution assumes that the space time is static, so there's a time reversal symmetry. And finally, we assume that the solution is vacuum, so there is no source of gravitational field, at least in the region we're considering. So we put the Ricci tensor or the Einstein tensor to zero. In the end, it's the same thing. So I will show you in the next few slides uh, a hand-waving derivation of this solution. You can make a more precise one. There's a bit more precise in misner ton wheeler gravitation or in Carroll's space-time and geometry, if you're curious. I will show you a more hand-waving one, but the one that should be fairly easy to understand and sufficient for the purposes of this lecture. So we would like to find a general expression for a metric of a space-time which is spherically symmetric and static. We begin by a two-sphere made of, of radius r and the metric induced on that. It's parameterized by theta and phi, and this is the standard metric. Now, imagine that we want to make a free space out of these spheres, representing a constant time slice. Uh, we assume that the radius of these spheres increases as we move away, so, so we can use this r as a radial coordinate. We assume that this radial coordinate is orthogonal to theta and phi. In fact, the space time would not be spherically symmetric if we did not assume that. But we have to assume that there is some kind of GRR unknown GRR type of thing in front of the R squared, and we don't know it yet. So that's the metric of a constant time slice. It's made of, it's woven from uh, spheres of increasing and increasing radius, this space. And then we want to add the time dimension, assuming that everything is stationary, or in fact, so there is no time dependence. So we have to assume that there is no time in any of the metric coefficients, but we have to allow for some, time, some kind of dt squared with gtt, which can depend on the radial coordinate r. And in principle, we could have a mixed dt dr type of uh, term as well, but not dt d theta d or dt d phi, because that would, again, uh, violate the spherical symmetry assumption. We assume the static reversal symmetry. This means that this term is not possible because if we reverse the time, the t, dt changes into minus dt and the sign here uh, flips. This doesn't happen with this term. So assume the time reversal symmetry, we're just left with gtt of r, some kind of function of, of r dt squared, grr of r, another function dr squared plus r squared the metric of a two-sphere. You can make it more precise, but in order to do it, I would have to define what, what it actually means for a space time to be spherically symmetric, and there's a bit of differential geometry involved, and I don't want to do that. Okay, so we write down our metric as minus e to two alpha r dt squared plus e to two beta r dr squared plus r squared, the metric of a sphere. And the reason I'm using this type of exponential things is that, first of all, I can impose the condition that dt is time-like uh, coordinate, because I can set the sign here. 
And also the equations simplify a little bit if we use this exponential substitution. Okay. Uh, you can derive the Christoffel symbols for this metric. They're not that hard to, do, to, to, to calculate. Then the Riemann tensor, which is a bit of cumbersome, but again, possible. Uh, out of that, we can build the Ricci tensor. Uh, assume that it's equal to zero. And we get, in fact, four equations because there is four non-vanishing components of R mu nu in this metric. This is the TT, RR, theta, theta, and phi phi. Here's what they look like. They're functions of the first and second derivatives of alpha and beta and alpha and beta and R. So we get ordinary differential equations for these alpha and beta from assumption that from assuming that this is equal to zero. But you see, it's easy to see that the fourth equation is just the repetition of the third one. So it's not independent. We just need to solve the first three. And the fourth one we will get for three. Uh, how to do it? Well, there is a well-known way, which you have to know. We begin by combining the TT equation and the RR equation in an appropriate way. And from that, we get a fairly simple equation for alpha prime and beta prime. Namely, alpha prime is equal to minus beta prime, which means that alpha is minus beta plus a constant C. So we can at least eliminate one of these functions at the expense of the other. So here's the metric we get. There is a constant here, C. However, we can get rid of this constant easily. It's just a question of rescaling the time coordinates. C is a constant over the whole space time. We just multiplied the time co coordinate by E to C, introduced this way a new T coordinate, and the new metric, well, it does not have C. It has this form over here, meaning that in this new coordinate, alpha is just minus beta. So uh, even though formally there was a constant of integration here, we can absorb it and don't worry about them and just assume that alpha is equal to minus beta. I will not use the t tilde, I will use standard t from now on. So after this readjustment, we take the theta theta. So we have used a combination of these guys. We know we eliminated uh, beta in terms of alpha. We then plug in. We then plug in this result to the theta theta equation. Uh, we get this equation over here, which is a first order ordinary differential equation for alpha, and can be solved. In fact, the simplest method is to simply note that what you see here on the left hand side is just the d over dr derivative of this thing over here, and this is trivial to solve e to two alpha needs to be equal to one minus constant of integration over R. This constant, constant of integration we'll call it Rs, is called the Schwarzschild radius, and it's a constant of the dimension of length. So in the end, this is the type of metric we get. Uh, one minus, so there's one, one constant of dimension of length involved. This is a one parameter family of solutions which looks quite similar to the Minkowski metric, except for these two prefactors. Uh, it's easy to check that it satisfies all the Einstein vacuum equations. We have used just a combination of the first two and the third one. And there's, you st we still have to check that, the, for example, the first one is satisfied, but it is. So it's a vacuum solution. Because of the spherical symmetry, it has four independent killing vectors, which I have written over here. The first one is the t over dt, and it simply tells that the it is there because none of these coefficients here depends on time explicitly. This last one corresponds to the differentiation with respect to phi, and indeed no coefficients of the metric depends on phi, the, the angular coordinate here. So 0, 0, 0, 1, d over d phi is also a killing vector. And there is two vectors corresponding to rotations with respect to the x and y axis, which are kind of more complicated. Obviously, the metric has singularities. One of them is at r equal to zero, where um, a, a lot of components blow up. But there is also, curiously, a, a singularity for a finite uh, r equal to rs, the Schwarzschild radius. 
In this case, this component blows up and this goes to zero, which is kind of interesting. So there's at least two candidates for similarities. And finally, if we go to infinity with R, the metric obviously tends to be metric G0, which is just the Minkowski metric in spherical coordinates. So far away for a very large R, the metric appears to be very close to a flat one. More precisely, you can show that it's asymptotically flat, which means more or less that, but in a more precise mathematical terms uh, related to the fall off of or how quickly the uh, the metric is approach the components of the metric are approaching the Minkowski metric. And they're approaching it relatively fast, so the metric is considered asymptotically flat. If you move far away, you just see the flat space time plus small perturbation. Okay, in the next lecture, we will more discuss this asymptotic region and what this metric looks like at large distances. But so far, I think this is enough for the lecture today. Thank you all very much and goodbye.